Technologies like this take several years, maybe even decades to develop and come to mass market, right? And it's all about timing at the end of the day, to have the foresight to be able to get ahead of the game. Acquiring that patent is key because, yeah. uh, you know, even when you look at these companies in Dubai doing all these test drone pilot, uh, uh, these drone um, simulations or tests from city to city, uh, because Dubai is so independent, right? They can they can actually take that risk. We haven't even gotten there in major cities in America, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, I don't know about close. the UK, but when they do, it will move fast. And when they move fast, they'll come to you. So, mm -hmm. you know, th th there might be another thing over there on your side. I know you've had a hard stop, Martin. Let me look at it conversely. The okay. If you don't laugh, you're going to cry because there are, there, you cannot do serious entrepreneurship without uh, a good dose of... Um, kind of irrational behavior particularly uh, when everything's under a lot of pressure you have to try and find the the, the the rational side of everything and sometimes you want to cry instead of laugh and and it's just part of working in a high pressure situation the buck stops with with entrepreneurs particularly founders but they carry a lot of responsibility and so i try to i try to be level-headed but but more of a, um, an optimist uh, i think you need the optimism when things that when you're staring down the barrel at what looks like potential your know, wide ramifications or indeed even failure uh, sometimes you have to push a little harder really than, than everyone mean, else building up your brand is whatever you created uh, really ain't no limit uh, you just gotta love it uh, working day and night it's all about the venture hustle hey venture hustle time to take it to the next level let's go all right welcome back to venture hustles podcast this is sergeant jack your co-host of the show Today, we're super excited to chat with Martin Warner, dubbed the UK's Elon Musk. Martin's a powerhouse in tech and entrepreneurship. He skyrocketed a 3D printing startup to a $50 million success, authored the bestseller, The Startup Story. With a career that's been a wild ride of innovation and success, Martin's story is one you do not want to miss. Martin, welcome to Venture Hustles. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for the invite. Good to now meet we're you. Nice to meet you as well. We are uh, super uh, honored to have you. I think this is uh, this is going to be really exciting. This is the first time we're yeah. having someone all the way out from the UK, mm -hmm. um, virtually in our studio. So we're pretty excited for this. Great, awesome, 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 awesome. So um, I guess you know. With that being said, we can start maybe with uh, yeah with the, I, with the new book here. Of course, we're going to talk about the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the first things I want I want you know we typically do here, Martin, is uh, uh, you know. To anyone that's listening that may not be aware of who you are, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, so, so I'm a, I'm kind of a, 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 you know, an Anglo-American. I'm, I'm born in Britain, but I've lived for the last um, you know, 27 years um, on the East Coast. Um, I'm back and forwards. I'm, I'm one of these rare people that kind of lives in both countries. Um, I've kind of done a lot of things, but I'm primarily an entrepreneur and an inventor. Um, and that's the better part of, of 20 years. Uh, additionally, uh, as a result of that, I taught entrepreneurship that goes back about 20 years uh, through my uh, um, uh, current incarnation, which is Entrepreneur Seminar. And then as well as inventing a bunch of things along the way, uh, I spent a lot of time in the film business and, and occasionally produced movies. And in fact, one of my other investments is uh, trying to fix the independent film movement um, mm -hmm. and trying to bring some of the unrepresented, fantastic, you know, movies that, that, that appear uh, from limited financing to the, to the mainstream. Um, a, a, a lot of the things um, that I've done that I'm probably more known for are particular technologies and inventions that, that surprisingly are credited to me along the way, whether it's be, you know, ticker technology and banking, uh, uh, full color 3D printing on the desktop, some strange things that I've uh, meandered into as part of being a, an entrepreneur. Uh, yep, I, I wrote a book just recently that kind of is a schizoid uh, memoir that kind of focuses just on 17 months of my life, which it surprisingly broke, and I'm sure we'll get into it, it broke a lot of records uh, because I'll, I'll throw this out there, that in today's world, in eight to 10 years, you can go and build a unicorn or a billion dollar business, but it's really hard to get 50 million out of uh, 17 months. And there are yeah. a lot of reasons, but one of them is there are no scaling triggers. So that was a crazy ride. Right. And so I ended up writing the book, The Startup Story, and it's done, you know, it's done, it's only out in the US at the moment, it's done, done very well. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. I think uh, we also appreciate you sending us the copies of your book, yeah. by the way. But if, if anybody uh, wants to check it out, The Startup Story, this is what Martin sent us. I had the mm -hmm. uh, chance to read a little bit of the book. I think I got through a couple of chapters. Martin, since he sent it to us, we only got it, uh, I think, a couple of days Last, ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, is it available on Amazon? Where Where is it primarily yeah. available? It, yeah. It, everywhere. You know, Rakuten, yeah, uh, Amazon. Uh, it was a, a day one uh, bestseller uh, at Barnes & Noble. Um, you can get it anywhere online or any, any, uh, I like to say fine bookstores, uh, but hopefully that's, that's <laughs> okay. most, of, most of, most of America. <laughs> and whilst it tops the charts of U USA Today, uh, bestseller list, uh, you know, hopefully it will, it will, it will stay in those bookstores for a, for a while. We'll mm -hmm. see. No, I, I think it's fantastic. And I, I, I it's an easy read, honestly. Yeah. I think uh, yes, a, a lot of people would enjoy reading it. It's, it's, I, I would say like your book is a, is a little bit of a mix of humor and education, right? Mm -hmm. From life experiences. Like, I guess on that topic, how important would you say like humor is in, in the journey of entrepreneurship? Well, let me, let me, let, let me look at it conversely. The, Okay. If you don't laugh, you're going to cry because there are there, you cannot do serious entrepreneurship without uh, a good dose of um, uh, kind of irrational behavior, particularly uh, you, when everything's under a lot of pressure. You have to try and find the, 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 the rational side of everything. And sometimes you want to cry instead of laugh. And, and it's just part of working in a high pressure situation. The buck stops with, with entrepreneurs, particularly founders. And they carry yeah. a lot of responsibility. And so... I try to I try to be level headed, but but more of a, um, an optimist. Uh, I think you need the optimism when things that when you're staring down the barrel at what looks like potential you know, wide ramifications or indeed even failure. Uh, sometimes you have to push a little harder than than everyone else. And again, that requires um, an optimistic, uh, somewhat humorous uh, view. And the story had so many ups and downs as you go through it. Every chapter, as I've been told, it appears like I tell you about something amazing that happened. And then all of a sudden, it's a roller coaster. We're pulled back down to earth. So it's a true roller coaster story because we had to do so much in such a compressed amount of time. And I think that, that I'd be lying if I said we were just laughing uh, all the way through this. We, there were a lot of uh, hysterical moments and high pressured situations. You know, 3D printing live on TV with a prototype was one of the things I probably would never do again. <laughs> I mean, I'll Incredible. tell you, no, I'll, I'll, like from my experience, I think um, this is a very unique story, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, we, both me and Jack are avid readers. We, we both read on a, on a daily basis. Um, we're always kind of rotating our material. Um, right now I'm reading a book um, called Fake by Ro Robert uh, Kawasaki, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, mm -hmm. right? And I think there are a lot of, it's funny because I was, I'm essentially reading three different books at the same time, including yeah. yours. And uh, I, 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 I think like not to make any comparisons, but it felt a lot of like, you know, how easy it is to read, let's say, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, mm -hmm. when he's talking about his story, um, his, his childhood experiences, yeah, even just the flow of the, of the overall book, too. just the flow. Mm -hmm. the, it, it, it's that easy to, to kind of go through the through your mm -hmm. journey. And, and I think at the first couple yeah. of chapters, let's see chapter one through four, maybe five, it's just building up to that. And you really have to be able to experience the different levels that you go through uh, that translate to the empire that you've essentially built. Um, so, and again, I, I've yet to, uh, uh, you know, sorry, I'll, I'll, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I, I'll share with you one thing and uh, just at the high level before we get into it. And that's uh, so I tried to write a book that, that, that was t full of in instructional insights. Right, so that the, so that you could get a prof, you know, professorial view, right, an education view of entrepreneurship. Keep it pragmatic. Keep it in the context of, of startups. Make it highly relatable. But the thing that mi that's missed in a lot of these stories is that there isn't. It's devoid of a compelling drama to you know the backdrop of something that, that keeps the reader interested. And actually, if you notice that books either and you've both compelling readers, you'll notice they appear as either narrative or they appear as how-to guides. So mm -hmm. I, I yes. don't know, I crazily thought I could do both. And I think I achieved it. And Booklist, who gave mm -hmm. a great review, um, you know, said that they see the, the schizoid part. They see that the educator in me is trying to say, look, even if I didn't follow my own rules, I had good reason. But here's what you might want to learn in each of these chapters. And at the same time, tell a chronological story across this 17 months from idea to exit. And I mm -hmm. think that that's been, uh, that's been somewhat of a, highly rate relatable story for anyone interested in business, let alone learning about entrepreneurship, which I try to do both. 
No, I think I think I think you yeah. you you. I hit think the you absolutely the achieve that for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. that's like a lot of times with like the books that we read. You know, if they're too textbook ish, you know, if they're a couple of chapters, like you know, I feel like I'm pulling my hair out trying to get through this. So, um, I w- I would certainly agree with that. That's what kind of you know the emotion drives us. You know, as humans for sure. In, in your book, Martin, you mentioned like tossing out some of the stuff that you used to teach, right? Can, can you tell us about a time when you just went with your gut instead of the usual rules, you know, let's say standard industry rules? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, at the end of the day, right, the modern entrepreneurial thinking is to break things up and, and, and look at the data and then trial everything, right? If we had time, we would sample and we would test. So whether that's product iteration, um, you know, whether that's you know, you know, customer surveys, whether that's looking at behavior, but all of this is good. But when you're moving or flying by the seat of your pants over 17 months and you've told the world that you think you've got the next best thing to the PC and you have a technology to invent, that whilst it existed in, in, in the market, there wasn't a, 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 anything that had 12 motors in a 3D printer. Right? Most of them had two motors and they weren't full color. <laughs> So we were pushing the bounds of physics and chemistry with something that was much harder than what was did at Apple when he created the first PC, uh, 400 moving parts. So we didn't have the opportunity to do what I would call structured testing. Uh, what we did was we wrote the chemistry out on paper, got out of the hot tub, put some filament in a fryer and said, let's see if you know, yellow and blue creates green. And if, if that happened, we thought, oh, we've got the chemical composition. Now let's design the engineering and a prototype to see if we can mm. extrude plastic into an object. These things were insane. If I had more time, even as a practical engineer, I'd never have done it like that in a million years. It's just that we needed to, to, I guess, follow convention, but structure it according to the amount of risk that we wanted to take. The other thing is that, 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 that well, there are many of these situations in this particular story, but I've got quite a few in my, my, my life, especially as I re- reflect back and decide what I want to teach as if you will, for first principles as a foundation to deciding if you're going to abandon you know, the book. But you have to understand before you abandon the book, what are the first principles? But a great one is, you know, most, you know, most at the end of the day, most things re- re- require an understanding of simple supply and demand. Most businesses create supply before demand. People say they did them together, but try telling Uber that, right? Uber, if you didn't have drivers, there's no point asking for customers. It's mm-hmm. the same in a product universe, right? I'm not going to sell products if I don't have a product. However, I decided that the best way to deal with PR was to break a controversial subject to the industry, let them debate it, tear it down, criticize it, and they would do all of our marketing for us because we had mm-hmm. a hyped industry and a, an incredibly provocative printer that most people felt that it had come down from a UFO. They didn't think it was possible. <laughs> and guess what? To this day... Right, not just the 17 months, for 21 months, four months after the business sold, we didn't pay a dime for marketing. It did it all for us. You know, TV shows wow. would call up. And so what I'd say, that again, that's the third example I've just given you where that's not first principles. Mm-hmm. Right? If we think about product launches, we would essentially put out the storyline. We would essentially have all our vetting. We would have all of our essentially uh, product iteration in terms of the rollout beta or prototype beta and then launch. And then we would create the story around as close to the launch and then into customer conversion or whatever our go-to-market is. Right. We didn't do that. What we, what we wanted to do was test the market, see the excitement, and start to pre-order in order to capture the market. We did it the reverse way around. Now, I knew what I was doing, and it was fraught with risk, but there are situations where you can afford to take that risk. And Mike, my co-founder, and I, we were, well, I'm not sure if you asked me we would do this again, but, but back then, I was 41, uh, we thought we could do anything. And we took an enormous amount of risk in order to seize that market opportunity. But we knew what rules we were breaking, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, Saj, if I may here, Martin, one of the, the you know, as you kind of go through, um, you know, your explanation and kind of giving these, these, us these tidbits here, like one of the common themes that, that I've noticed and even throughout some of the book is speed. Right, how quickly you're able to kind of not only overcome challenges, um, but kind of get through that process, you know, launching, et cetera. Um, what would you say are some of the key, I guess, aspects of getting to a um, an exit like that 
outside of speed or would you say that that might be one of the most important ones what would be your take on that i'm very interested to kind of see your thoughts on this yeah yeah so, so i'll give you a lot but but i'll try to keep okay. it simple um and, sure. and I, I i think the thing about entrepreneurship is always uh, not to get too conceptual but to keep everything relatable because if you ask any good or great entrepreneur a lot of what they tell you will be 70 percent true and 30 percent they would just been able to react in the situation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, conceptually, um, there are a bunch of things you can do to accelerate a startup, right? This one, as, as I mentioned, if it wasn't 2013, sold at the end of 2014 and launched uh, at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, January 2015, if that was, you know, January 2013, uh, 2023, it'd be a billion dollar business. There's a lot that's different about it. And that's that at that time, we, we decided that um, it it didn't matter necessarily what the precise outcome was. We wasn't building, so we didn't have this idea that if we solved a big problem, this needed to be a billion dollar business or a fifty million dollar business. What we did know was that if we wanted to enter, if we wanted our product to enter the industry, there are certain things that we would have to, if we were going to, if you will, put ourselves on the line or put ourselves in front of the public consumer 3d printing media that we would have to do a ton of acceleration and we would essentially have to jump the shark or, or essentially you know hurdle some processes yeah. so think of it as a pyramid right i'm going to tell you right in, in three a three-tier pyramid first of all you have the tools and processes at the bottom and there are a ton of things you can do to accelerate a startup first of all know what is necessary right at the beginning of the startup so that you don't break fundamental like accounting where you go back and you can't exit your business because you can't figure out where your receipts are. There are a ton of those little widget uh, processes that just, if you build them right, they're cheap, cost effective. They require a little bit of awareness. And I tell every entrepreneur, go learn it from someone that knows how to set up what I call a light and nimble company. Okay. The second thing to do is, is, is to understand, you know, have you actually gone far enough with an idea that you have visualized what the product or solution is and you understand its route to market and you have a strong profile of the customer these three elements can could save you tons of time and then the last bit before we move up from the tools and the processes is that before we do this what does the market look like is it defensible you know, what kind of ip protection do we need is there a pattern uh, needed is it all about time to market or ttm what is it we're doing to get there the second part of it is engagement um, and, and engagement, and I don't think of engagement in terms of social media, I mean engagement in terms of how do those processes get you to take these leaps forward? And this is where advanced entrepreneurship comes in. So if I said to you, like, you know, what is it, what is involved in, in failing at getting your story to market? I will work it backwards from engagement of, of the reader understanding what we're doing, engaging and telling us they really want um, our product to what we needed to do to get it through the, the, the PR process. And that means telling a story that is going to jump uh, the, the engagement cycle, getting to the point where they can act. If they get to act, you get to measure it. You get to things like pre-orders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the second thing is that, you know, you know if, if we're going to do any PR at all, and I won't go through every function, you have to decide, is this a consumer story? You know, is it an industry story? Uh, where's the bridge? How do they get across it? And there are different tricks. Having done a lot of PR, I think you can see Ultimately, but I think I know that story better than the PR agencies themselves. I knew that we had a hype cycle. I knew that there was buying behavior behind the hype cycle. And I knew that the minute I said that we had this, we would be able to get out and, 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 and um, you know, engage this audience. I mean, and it, uh, two great examples of, of early validation. Twitter was just deforming, right? Twitter was having problems, but, but nothing mm -hmm. like it is today. And, you know, the minute we turned it on and said, hey, we're open to pre-orders, you know, within five hours, we did two hundred odd thousand dollars. In nineteen hours, we did close to half a million dollars, and this was on one statement. And so we knew we had something, you know, something red hot. Um, and, and, and again, other types of uh, engagement that are clear is, you know, understand what was what was the route to market, what were the potential outcomes, and if you raise money with VCs, you you get to the same challenge, and that's that they ask you to be somewhat visionary. And they, they ask you to say, well, where do you see this going? So is there a place in other competitors? Uh, what is it that they're going to look at? And that requires a lot of analysis. Um, is it going to be that you're trying to build this as a big company and, and IPO it? What, is it? what are those different paths? 
But there are some substrands that you have to understand. For us, it was what kept us even afloat, what kept us in the market. And that was if we could register our 106 patents and ultimately get the one that we wanted that said we owned full color 3D printing, which essentially was taking plastics, what we use with PLA or polylactic acid. And we essentially took CMYK and white, and essentially that is uh, like an inkjet printer. Okay. And we essentially, they're thermoplastics, right? We get them up to 200 plus degrees and then extrude them down through a needle onto a hotbed and Bob's your uncle. You get a, a, an object, right, that's forming in a, in a layered process. Right. We knew that if we had that, the number one competitor and the number two competitor would have to go through us. And that means we would get bought. So the yeah. bet we actually made that, that jumped all the process, all the discussion with the VCs was that we knew that if we could grant the pattern and then form the product, even if the product didn't fully get to market, we would get acquired. And so that you know, these are areas where you can accelerate the story. Now, if you're accelerating the story, you immediately, in order to garner that, have to determine you know, at what point are you building a prototype? At what point are you doing the trade shows? At what point are you going on pre-order? Um, and what, at what point do you think your product is going to be ready for first iteration for distributors to sell it around the world? In a matter of nine months, we had 21 distributors, one in China, one in Russia, two in Japan, right away through Europe and to the US. I was stunned at the speed of me being able to strike those deals. It was all because of that hype cycle. Yeah, we'll get on to what goes wrong at that speed. But we jumped yeah. a lot of the, the basic processes in order to position ourselves to have the bigger conversation of growth or exit. And we had to I, do that in this middle tier. So I was going to say the last point of the pyramid, just so you know, the, the top part of the pyramid is, is always understanding what are the priorities of those processes because they're inextricably linked. If you say something to social media or you say something to just dis distributors, you know, how's that going to affect the end consumer? And ultimately, how does that affect the media and the trade shows and your marketing? You have to determine very clearly what it is you're doing and how does that affect internally the morale of the team that's working literally through the night and our manufacturer. <clears throat> you have to make sure that all of that is coordinate, coordinated and essentially then if you extrude it downwards, what you should get is essentially a managed process, areas you know that you can accelerate, and tools that you know you need to have in place. And everything else you eliminate, you get rid of. So I think there's, there's a thing that a lot of people don't understand, which is forced marketing and PR never usually works, right? I think from your experience and a lot of what you've done and achieved uh, and building a company as rapidly as you did, a lot of it was highly, highly strategic PR, highly strategic mm -hmm. movements, right? Um, I, I guess, you know, to piggyback off of what you were saying, Jack, which is speed, right? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you maintain, Martin, a balance between speed and sustainability? Yeah, so I, I think that... Um, Startups by nature, right? In the beginning, a founder or co-founders, right? They wear multiple hats in order to get going. And when they hit the first 10 people, it's an inordinate jump to get to 12 people. And then it's an even bigger jump to 25, et cetera. And, and we sat in this, this 25 model, right? And before we knew it, we were, we were gone, right? We, we, got it, we, got, we got acquired. And so there's a very different argument in as much that that company, uh, if it's working really hard and wearing multiple hats, it's probably more nimble than a large company, but it's not looking at any mature processes, right? And it's not looking to, you know, grow sales. You know, at the end of the day, right, we, we grew, you know, customer sales a few million, um, distributor sales five million. Um, a lot of this was recognizing as revenue because we were getting product off the shelf. We didn't need to go any bigger before we achieved these records and, and, and got the strategic exit. Um, I think that, I think it just, it, it, you know, it just depends. Um, if, okay. What, what, what I would say is for, for a company like Bot Objects and, and you know, for where it was in terms of speed, there's something really unique about, about managing kind of uh, the, the, the momentum, for want of a better word. And that's that you keep, you keep yourself centered at the top of the pyramid. Like what is, what is the most number one thing? Like I remember uh, right at the beginning, uh, Mike and I you know, were smoking cigars in the hot tub and said, boom, let's invent a company. Right? I mean, literally, that was it. I knew a lot about uh, full color and, and he was building part-time printers where boom, let's do this. And before you knew it, I'd come up with the name of the company, the, the printer name, you know, Prodest 3D did not sound like MakerBot or any of these crazy uh, pre-dams. It sounded like something I wanted to create. The reason for 
uh, the, the look of the printer looked like an Apple product was because we were brought up on the Steve Jobs era. And it looked, mm -hmm. yeah, we wanted an Apple looking product. But what we always knew was we knew what we needed to do in terms of product development. We knew what hires we needed to make. We had a software development plan. We had a hardware manufacturing plan. We had these tests in place. We knew how quickly we needed the media to react. We knew what we needed to test with customers. We had all of these different pieces together. It wasn't that we ignored them. It's just occasionally we saw a better way in order to jump those processes. So could we engage the market to drive revenue and prove the case for what we're doing? Could we accelerate taking a shaky prototype to a trade conference? I remember sending one out with Mike to the Tokyo Design Week. The bloody thing crashed in the, in, in, in the um, storage of the, of the um, airplane because it was bumping oh, through no. turbulence. When he landed, we're, 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 we're shipping acrylic like 11,000 miles, <laughs> right? He was rebuilding it in his, in, in his, in his room before the conference. Yeah, oh we, knew, we knew we were too early. We were on Fox News um, and it kept saying, up next, you know, Protus 3D, we will be live, you know, live 3D printing. And we were. Of course, we had a backup for how that really worked and we coordinated how we wanted to do that. But that was highly risky. It was a bit more like David Copperfield. And, mm -hmm. and I think ultimately we, we look for... We look for ways to take all these different plans from our resource plans, our distributing, et cetera, marketing, PR, hardware, software, and say, okay, how do these come together? What's the top of the pyramid? And where can we make these succinct hurdles in order to accelerate? So we did a ton of, of PR. We did a ton of trade shows. And this was really important to stay ahead of the market and fight the competitors and ultimately led to our exit. I got a question for you. I, did you have a number in mind, Martin? of what your number would be to exit at? I think back then um, we, we were talking a number of 150 million and there are a few things that, that, that happened. I, mean, I think that, I mean, first of all, we had you know, metrics to be candid that probably didn't support more than about a 75 to 85 million uh, valuation, but we thought That's the hype could drive that premium. But as an ex-VC, I, I knew I was being ambitious. What, I, yeah. what we all didn't want was that uh, the company that bought me had hyped even more than we had the industry. And by the way, we really were just by, bystanders. Everyone wanted every smart home to have a 3D printer, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone thought, well, this could be great. Problem was, they weren't as evolved um, as everyone perhaps wanted them to be. And that meant that, um, you know, you weren't going to click a button like a microwave and boom, cook a dinner or, or out come uh, mm -hmm. a beautiful iPhone yeah. case that looks like it should look. I mean, we could print iPhone cases. They look like they give you splinters, right? They were, yeah. they were ugly <laughs> looking things. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, so they were more for industrial designers, uh, you know, kids that want to learn about uh, 3D printing, prototyping, that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I think that we were ambitious. But what we didn't see was because of that reason, the market was about to take um, uh, a reduction in size. I wouldn't call it a crash. I wouldn't call it a bubble. I would call it the natural ascension of the hype cycle. Um, and we okay. we were at the top and we got what we thought was, um, well, I don't regret. It was a great, it was a great result for 17 months. Uh, no one, no one mm -hmm. would turn down more money, um, yep. but, but it probably was reasonable considering the market dramatically slowed down after that. In, in hindsight, it was a good decision. No, I mean, you, there's no way you can regret something like that. For that's, sure. that that's a life-changing decision and also mm -hmm. uh, just propels you to your next move, you know, frees you up just gives you a lot more um, industry, a lot more space, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, now, given your experience, I mean, how I know you do a lot of mentorship, a lot of guidance for startups. So how do you view the, the role of mentorship and, and guidance in the world of startups like now, right? Uh, what is important to focus on? Mm -hmm. Well, I, so, so I, the, the first thing I'd say is that there's a lot of uh, people, um, there's two issues, first of all. One is that, that people believe they don't need mentoring. And, and there's that kind of school of entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs that get out there and say, hey, yeah, we can learn this. And more so in the younger generation, right? The, you know, the Gen Z, um, you know, they're, they're all, all too willing to abandon the rule book and toss it out the window and go on social media and sell something without really knowing that there was a technical skill set behind what to do. Um, and the other side of the people are, are those that think they can learn it or just they are going to sit themselves on an island at slow growth and they'll pick it up over time. By the way, I mean, I think you want to take risk. You can learn and learn it yourself. It, that, that's what business is all about. But I actually don't agree with that. And, and 
I think that the job is hard enough. I think mm -hmm. there's real risk. It's life changing risk. And if you're a founder, it's normally at least some of your own money that I've never wanted to make the mistake that someone next to me could have told me not to. And mm -hmm. so I think mentoring and coaching is extremely important. I do mm -hmm. think that a lot of the um, I think charlatans is the wrong word, but there's a lot of people out there offering uh, advice and, and couldn't take it down to a process level if you if you ask them. Right. Mm -hmm, they would mm -hmm. rather sell you and they'd rather sell you someone else's book. And and so I think you, you got to be careful of, of what kind of mentoring you get. But I think tools based mentoring with practical experience is fine. What you don't want is, again, is the top of the pyramid. One of the famous entrepreneurs saying, yeah, here's this one piece of advice that will help you with recruitment. Well, that's bloody great. But what about everything else that sits around it? Right. They're yeah. not really going to help you if you Google that shit. Uh, mm -hmm. At the process level, no one's writing about it because no one cogently wants to describe it. Mm -hmm. So the way I approach mentoring um, an entrepreneur seminar was written um, just uh, what 22 years ago, and I've updated it now twice, um, is that I view functions as decision clusters. In other words, most, most decisions in a startup or venture um, would be made at one level above. In other words, if I want to launch um, uh, a product in the market, I'm going to look mm -hmm. at my marketing plan, slash advertising, right? I'm going to look at, at my sales plan in terms of what I can do in terms of conversion. And then I'm going to look at my product plan in terms of what, my readiness. So there's a set of decisions that you need to make and put them in. I've got about, it's just over 500 where I call what I call decision clusters. And rather than teach people to remember that like chess as an algorithm, which is not a great way to learn entrepreneurship. And I can, I can attest to it because I used to want to turn entrepreneurship to a science and it's not a science. There's a lot of gut, there's a lot of instinct, a uh, lot of things that can go wrong. And like, much like chess, there's many different moves you can make. But what I do think is that I can relate those different types of decisions. And I do that through 10 <laughs> modules that I teach. And I recommend they don't just come on and, and be mentored by me, uh, which is something that's an interactive personal experience, one-on-one -on -one, through the database and through two sessions I teach a month. But go do the, the reading. Go learn where all the hurdles are in the chronology of setting up a company. You know, what do you do in the beginning and why do you do it? And what kind of decisions are you likely to face in that first three to six months and then six to 12 months? And, and I go through that in a, in, a, in, in a fair amount of detail to inform them of better questions so they've got a foundation. And then I think you get into what I call custom or what I call in chess, the middle game scenarios. So now they figure out what this product is. They've obviously got a solution. They've got an idea of what that customer is, but they don't know what their route to market is. Well, that's a good thing to mentor yep. on, right? Mm -hmm. You could go and talk about that and create a, 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 you know, a suggestion or set of scenarios. So I think it's super important in order to avoid the pitfalls of, of others. That's for sure. And But my, my, my recommendation is think carefully about the type of program. And I think it needs to be practical-led. Take nothing away from any of the universities doing business studies, uh, entrepreneurship programs. Um, but case in point, uh, I think the, the industry is moving so fast um, that you fundamentally want to understand the practical side of entrepreneurship rather than just a conceptual. Mm -hmm. I agree. I uh, and I think uh, I mean, a lot of people do that now, right? And I think um, it, it's just the, the resources available are so vast. Mm -hmm. There's so many options. So I know you were like, I, I don't want to say the word charlatans, but the reality <laughs> is the world we live in now, there are, there are a lot of them. Uh, so, yeah. so it's important to be able to, uh, I mean, that's what our platform does. That's what uh, venture hustles is all about is, yeah. is bringing on, I, I think you're perfect for the show, by the way. So we appreciate you coming out again. Absolutely. Um, and I think there are a lot yeah. of lessons to be learned here. I think, uh, yeah, firsthand. without a doubt. And, um, to kind of harp on like the mentorship, like aspect, uh, Martin, where you mentioned, you know, especially for Gen Z younger people, that's one of the mistakes that they make. Now this might be more of a clay, uh, cliche question here, but. Is that the biggest mistake that you say most entrepreneurs make is um, not seeking out guidance or not being able to learn from others? Or if not, you know, what would it be? I, I don't know if it's, um, you know, there's lots of uh, rule books um, out there that, that talk mm -hmm. about different approaches to entrepreneurship, some old ones as well. And I also think that mm -hmm. there's people that have guessed at what are the top 10 things by doing surveys and all that rubbish. I, I'll give you a few. I think it's one of them. I think I think if okay. you're not willing to learn from others and by making an investment of a few hundred quid or, or dollars or a thousand or two, I think you probably don't want to go and spend 50 to a hundred thousand dollars on seeding. 
right? Because what you'll learn, that's the simplest answer for you, that mm -hmm. if you're not willing to learn from not just someone like me, or some, but hopefully someone um, similar to me that, that's gone cradle to grave several times and has taught it for 20 years, I know I'm in I'm in the minority of pro I think that's why the program does pretty well is I'm I hope I'm relatable and the, it's got a lot of experience the program, um, mm -hmm. but but you got to find someone because I think that let's say it's a couple of thousand dollars is going to be transformative in terms of guiding you um, you know through through your startup. As for other problems, I think the entrepreneurship is so real um, in terms of the minute you step in, you know the business doesn't have a heart. It doesn't care if you fail, right? It just exists. It ticks mm -hmm. on 24 seven. It will never take enough food from you, right? It will just take <laughs> everything. And we have to stop and think of it as if you were going down a gentle hill while you were asleep, you hopefully don't crash, but you wake up and it's still moving. You, you then start to pedal again. And that's what the business is. And so I think pressured finance is another area that people don't really understand. There's an old saying out of the valley, no cash, you crash. Um, I think it's so easy to not fund your business properly, uh, not go far enough in terms of that fundraising, either dilute yourself, not raise enough money, upset people for the first round, not get to the second round, you're out of the game. This is why in five years, the majority of, of startups are dead. So I think pressured finance is, is the, the area, I call it, for anything to do with uh, cash flow or startup funding. And most of it is in, again, uh, the financial planning against your activity analysis in order to figure out just, do you really have enough? And do you have enough contingency if things go wrong? And more and more, I think a lot of investors are just unrealistic, right? It's okay for inflation to go up, but you try and get an investor to say, look, aren't we still in the world of just giving you $50,000 to prove a product? They're dreaming. It's gone up a lot more. Right, mm -hmm. seed funding at fifty thousand uh, will get you on what I call the the you know the the uh, kind of the no hope land. Right, you you kind of need you need everything to swim across the channel and get away from the the sharks. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> right, most mm -hmm. most companies are just going to fail. It's better to go after three times that amount of money. Um, mm -hmm. I think another area is is, is over ambition. Obviously, uh, we could talk about it, but entrepreneurial traits, and I, you know, there are a lot of different uh, models, but I've got 26 of them that I always talk about. One of them is customer advocacy, right? And we all, if you can't sell your venture, uh, and I was the person that needed to do that for bot objects in the book, right? No one's going to sell it for you if you aren't a great uh, uh, advocate for your business. You may not be a, a natural salesperson, but you've got to be an advocate. The reality is there are some things you need to know about advocacy that can help you in, in authentic passion in reaching customers, authentic messaging in terms of engagement, whether it be digitally or offline. But what you can't do is, uh, is abandon the principles of advocacy and just take great risk like we did in the book at times without understanding the ramifications. I call that over ambition. And I'll give you an example where it happens. There are three islands in the world you know, one of them is that you're an entrepreneur, but you don't really have the big idea. So you go and work with a company that's in its B round of finance and you get some stock options. You may do real well, but the product's built. It has customers, right? That's a form mm -hmm. of entrepreneurship. The other one is you're a mum and pop shop. It's a small little island. It's slow growth. It's chilled out. Everyone goes home at six o'clock at night. They open the card shop up the next day and they go and sell cards, right? Guess what? You might turn into the next hallmark for all I know. Right. And you may make a ton of money over time. And that's fine. You probably aren't going to have the over ambition card being played there. But if you are like a lot of these kids that come out and they see the startup programs or super pumped or one of these bloody programs or they're in the valley, they want to be an entrepreneur. They think it's sexy. They're probably going to it be in software or tech in some form or a web based business. And they look at it and they say to themselves, wow, why is my island got a, a volcano in the middle and it's burning all the time? Right. You've yeah, got to be extremely at. resourceful. And that's, by the way, what we chose, right? We chose a volcano. And mm -hmm. so that's over ambition. Just to even get on that island, you've got to be over ambitious. And I think, again, if you're not really careful and you, and you don't really understand the game, um, it's extremely difficult to get through that and survive. So over ambition often kills a lot of entrepreneurs. And I'll tell you now, they get their traits wrong and they don't figure it out properly. The other one is, a players hire A players, B players hire C players, C players hire D players. You need great people 
And you need the reason that Bot Objects su survived is that Mike was a, a genius practical engineer. He was the more technical guy. We both were technical. He also could understand business, and I was the CEO. If you get that wrong right from the beginning, God help you. It will it will be tough. And again, so overstating what's there, that's more ignorance than overambition. It falls into the first example. So there's some examples of where I think a lot of, of um, problems in, in, you know, of, unfortunately in, in startups burning out. Wow. Yeah. I, I like that uh, description of the three islands it really kind of makes sense. Yeah. You know, it gives you a great yeah. visual too. Wow. It does. Mm -hmm. I, I think... Um, one of the things I want I was interested in knowing is what's been your experience working with some of your partners or your co-founders post exit, right? What's been the main focus? Mm. Oh, so if 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 you are even working with them, right? I think well, I was your say, so, yeah. So, so Mike's like a, a, a younger brother to me. Uh, we're close. Uh, we, you know, I always say, say that that. You know, you can play with a lot of people, but you're not always in the same. You're, you've got different ages. You're not always in the side. It's a bit like Lionel Messi right now. He's in America, right? Um, you know, he could have gone anywhere. And he went to America, but he's still got friends around the world. And I think of startups the same way. Uh, you know, generally, um, I find people that are at the point in time to do something. Everyone's got their ambition, their commitments, their financial pressures, um, their opportunities. And, and so that's not always in alignment. For Mike and I, it was kind of cool. We came out of Bot Objects, and um, he, in one of my startups, now came in and helped um, really get me going uh, with Flix Premier, my my movie streaming business, um, mm -hmm. and just turned his efforts and you know, straight into, you know, software engineering, and 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 so you know we you know so we have that um, you know together, um, and and you, and again it, it, with other people along the way, depending where they are, they've come back to me. Uh, where we particularly engineers and, and form part of my business generally because uh, you know generally I, i'm the i'm the guy that uh, more so now in the last 10 years is funding a lot of the early parts of of, of of those companies so certainly all of the seed round um and and so i'm in a position to hire um and 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 so i'm i'm, I'm someone that that can find an, an, or are looking for those previous relationships uh but i think yeah i think you might the question might be alluding to you know, there's just an outcome of uh, the, there's different outcomes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, whether companies are successful or failing. Um, when they when they're successful, it's either internecine warfare, uh, the war mm -hmm. amongst others that hurts them, um, or you know they're essentially you're already falling out of bed because they couldn't get their act together and they were under pressure and it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, if it's always about um, you know who's running the company or the shares, they got something wrong. That stuff's the easy bit. That's the easy bit in startups, mm -hmm. right? The hard bit is the execution every time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think you get all different outcomes. You know, we, Mike and I, I was the first to leave the, the parent that bought us. And then Mike came out, I think it was six months later than me. Um, you know, th there are always different reasons for why we want to evolve. We hope to carry on the journey and whatever. So that can play a little bit into uh, your ability to, to or, or, or sorry, to, to decide what kind of relationship with you have, have with your founders. You know, in, in this the current example, uh, you know, Mike and I went through the most stressful period. You'll see it in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, but we're good friends. He's like family to me. So it's, it's a little different. Uh, so I think one of the one of the things you're focusing on right mm -hmm. now is the just the movie, the film, the independent film movement. Right. I think that's that's mm -hmm. kind of what you're involved in right now. Why? Right. Why? Why that space? What's the. Uh, it's a radically different direction from your past experiences or your trajectory, unless I missed something. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I want to point out to you, uh, given that given you've asked a question that leans to my product preference and also my experience, I'm no three D <laughs> printing guy. I'm no three D printing guy. Right? I mean, uh, I, 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 I am historically now, right? I mean, the history yes. for it, but and, and yes. by far we had the sexiest, most controversial game changing print and that's a fact and, and i'm deeply proud that we were able to to do that and there was some shift some shifty thinking around product marketing you know how do you how do you even pretend that you know this stuff and i'm not sure we really pretended it but we certainly made up some stuff that we thought sounded good you know we had <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna answer your question but i'll give you an example most printers yeah. had two fans that called the object we added a yeah. third fan because we had such a complex extrusion needle that got hot 
So I okay. called that the Trifan Trifan architecture. It went around the industry like we had, you know, something like iPhone 15 titanium. They thought we yeah, I, fundamentally <laughs> changed the game. Uh, I just read that part too. Market. I think you were kind of going right. back and forth and they were like, oh, you just added a third fan. Uh, I think that's yeah, what right, right. In, in the yeah, <laughs> right. Right. I, mean, I mean, of course I there it. were things in there though. There were things in there that were genius, right? I mean, you know, we had 12 motors and we mm-hmm. sold it for a Mercedes price instead of a Lamborghini, right? There, this stuff is all conceptually true, but I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, I, I look back and... So I'm assuming I really, don't, I, I really don't know. This is the actual passion, I guess, like in terms of like what really draws you to because you mentioned this even in your opener, right? So it kind of stood out to me a little bit as in because a, a person like you that's exited that 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 that's kind of like settled into more so uh, that the next chapter of your life, right? You're really focusing on either I am pumping money into things that are going to get me more money. In, in, a, in mm-hmm. simple terms, or I'm just going to do things I love, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. So which, I yeah. guess, which one is it? Yeah, it's the last one. And, and I'll, I'll just give you some case points. I, I, I'm a meanderer, right? I, I will always go with my passion. I tell my kids, uh, I hope you really get a chance to do something that you're passionate about. And, and if you are, then I'm going to really get behind that and support that and try uh, uh, to help you be successful at something you're passionate about. There's nothing worse then getting old and complaining about a life where you was you lack purpose or didn't achieve something. I think the idea though around like I mean I'm, I was being facetious, right? Mike and I, of course, became good students and experienced at 3D printing. And we would never have really got to the consumer electronics show with an advanced printer, right? But we are voracious learners, right? And and a bit like uh, when Yahoo, you you boys look a little young. I'm 51. You look a little young to remember this, but in the old days. <laughs> there was this um, Yahoo news ticker that went across the bottom of the screen, right? The really mm-hmm. old ticker. And it used to have the you know, current affairs, the news and all that on it. Well, I was the first guy to hack that to a corporate news ticker. And that was the ticker that found its way onto trading screens in bank investment banks. And we would put mm. currencies, trades, derivative prices and all of that on there. And I just wanted to hack it, that's all. I just wanted to see what would happen. And in the days of uh, things like software development, like agile computing, well, I'm one of the two guys behind Extreme Rad, right? I didn't like all the paperwork and the stuttering mm. between the stages of software development. So I called that, you know, that, that was ultimately was Extreme Rad. Um, and this has stayed with us today, right? No one wants to, everyone wants to storyboard, everyone wants object oriented analysis. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you other than it, I meandered through life and found something that I felt I had a solution for, right? And and I teach this and I say to people, there are many ways to create, form, you know, to become more educated, to read, 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 to, to go and network, to put yourself in peer groups. Some people will come up with ideas quicker than others. They're mm-hmm. not all eureka moments. Some of them are systemic. Mm-hmm. They evolve mm-hmm. from things that we've done. And sometimes, <laughs> you know, me, I'm curious, I'm, I think there's a guy who wrote an article, I think it's on Amazon. Um, I was reading it recently and he said, I'm the kind of guy that if you come out of a bar after six hours, you have hundreds of ideas. And, and I'm a, I spend my time looking at the future and thinking about why things are the way they are. I'm just, just, just a thing that I love. I read books like that and I'm just generally somewhat curious. So when Mike there was puffing my cigars and said, hey, you know, I build these printers, I started thinking, I really like those. But mm-hmm. what, what's the chemistry behind it? Like what, what physics you know, do you really need to, you know, really need to have in place to make that happen? Or what's missing in that industry? The minute we started talking about that, we went, can't we do that? Before you knew it, we were on a jet and we were talking to Solid Smack. You can't write this. This very small Twitter channel that had all the influences of the industry at the Javits Center in New York City. And boom, that was it. We were, we were researching and, and, you know, learning as we were you know, <laughs> flying by the seat of our pants, but that's what we were doing. So with, with movies, it's a little different. As a kid, I um, wanted to uh, be in the movie business. Yeah, you know, like a lot of kids, you know, want to be an astronaut, fireman, an mm-hmm. actor, whatever. I loved everything about the movie business and still do to this day, which is why I'm very close to the Cannes Film Festival. I keynoted over there. Um, oh, very I, cool. Yeah, I worry about uh, independent film. I'm one of the m- more established advocates around the world for independent film. Um, I think ultimately the identity of film sits in independent cinema. If that was to disappear, there would be no studio movies. And Mm -hmm. I didn't want my kids growing up in a world of just 
franchise movies and movie heroes, Marvels and God knows what. And not that mm-hmm. those movies, there's anything wrong with them. But, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, we go to the movie theater, not just to escape for a sense of entertainment, but we go there to be informed, right? To look, at, you know, to look through the lens at life. And I think it's an all too, all too important medium in order to just shut out independent film. And I feel so passionate about it that I started this business to influence uh, uh, policy in the industry and at the same time to have a lot of fun. And everyone knows I love enterprise software and I built a pretty, pretty cool enterprise streaming solution. We're both a streamer, but we're also a product development company. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's trying a- my hands at software. It's a technical product. Uh, you yeah. might have ruffled some feathers over there with our producer James, because uh, uh, the the minute you said Marvel, yeah, uh, I was going to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, I got nothing against. I know it just got. I know, Marvel I know. just got slammed, right? Ter- yeah. Terribly slammed. But, but no, do I, that well. I don't. In fact, one of my kids right now is watching uh, the prequel, The Hunger Games, and okay. I couldn't go because I've got got this podcast with you guys. And at the end of the day. All these movies are fun. There's no, you know, there's very, yeah. very few bad movies in in the heart of why they're being created, right? Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just that we want as many movies, right, to stuff the, or or to fill uh, the airwaves, and that that's really my point about independent film is that I think more people deserve to see mm-hmm. these these wonderful creations. But you've probably read. I don't just teach. You know, I've got an enterprise uh, learning platform entrepreneur seminar, but I'm also the first British pioneer to to develop electric aviation uh, here in the UK. Mm-hmm. And even though we do some research around the world, uh, we primarily build our prototype. We're on our second electric aircraft um, in the in my company, Autonomous Flight. And you know that came out of my, um, I don't want to confuse this here, but random autonomous routes, figuring out how parcels could be delivered by air. And imagine uh, you wow. guys are in Long Island. So just imagine uh, that you've got, I don't know, if you pick, pick five areas around you, a 30 mile radius, right? So Huntington, you know, right yeah. away up to Riverhead, okay. over to you, right? So you've got all these different areas. Imagine at 11 o'clock, 100,000 people ordered a parcel from Amazon, right? What we know for sure is the parcel and the people would be different at 11 o'clock every day. No one orders the same thing every mm-hmm. day, right? So if you were to look down at your and draw a circle around your area, that network of, of drone traffic delivering parcels would look like a Jackson Pollock painting. Right? It would look like a, a complete neural network of rubbish. That means you need to have a, a 3D view of flight envelopes. Right? So what's the floor? What's the service ceiling? What's the flight separation? How these drones are going to fly? How are they going to deal with weather conditions? How do they cross flight routes? All this needs to be figured out. That's called random autonomous routes, and I have the pattern for that. So I believe that wow. when these wow. – this is another bot objects, right? In other words, once Walmart – Google, Amazon finally get the go ahead after their test license to deliver parcels. They're going to need, I think, something like what I've got in order to deliver at scale. And I worked out 720 domesticated cities can deliver 1.4 million drones. Wow. Right, so around the world, that is. So this is mm-hmm. a, it's a trillion, trillion dollar uh, air logistics industry. And, and I think I've got a, an enterprise software solution and, and autonomous routes. However, that's called eVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing. That led me mm-hmm. to putting people in the sky. And that led me to build a passenger view using the same concepts. And that's autonomous flight. So what got me into that? I was, I just believe that eVTOL technologies pushing good services and people up in the sky is a trillion dollar industry and also I mean, fascinating. Very. Yeah, you're you're, you're definitely very. Uh, and that's the Elon Musk bit, by the way. That's why I get called it. Yeah. No, I mean you're definitely way ahead of the uh, of the space, right? Things like sure. t- technologies like this take several years, maybe even decades, to develop and come to mass market, right? And yeah. it's all about timing at the end of the day to have the foresight to be able to get ahead of the game. Acquiring that patent is key because yeah. uh, you know e- even when you look at these companies in Dubai doing all these test drone pilot, uh, uh, these drone um, simulations or tests from city to city. Uh, because Dubai is so independent, right? They can they can actually take that risk. We haven't even gotten there in major cities in America, mm-hmm. right? Uh, no, I, I don't know about close. the UK, but when they do, 
it will move fast. And when they move fast, they'll come to you. So, mm -hmm. you know, th th there might be another thing over there on your side. I know you've had hard stop, Martin. Uh, I got one more question on my side. I don't know if Jack, you, you've had no, anything yeah, else. Go, go right ahead. Go um, ahead and you're good, by the way. I've, I've just got my, I've just got a text. I actually have 10, 15 minutes. You're good. Oh, no, cool. no worries. Oh, Fantastic. Great. Well, I, I want to ask you this anyway. I, I think in 2017, I went to the UK uh, for a couple of days and uh, I had the chance to see my favorite team uh, and, and, and uh, my favorite Premier League team. So uh, before I tell you what it is, well, what's your what's your what's your what's your if 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 you do have a favorite Premier League team, what would it be? Well, so now it's Chelsea. Uh, okay. My son is uh, my son played at the summer camp and I live vicariously. Uh, through his, uh, you know, uh, football love, and you end up just loving it. So we're we're actually season uh, ticket holders uh, oh, for nice. Chelsea. Wow! Uh, uh, yeah, in the middle in the middle tier. So we love it. When I was a boy, um, you know, I was a Liverpool supporter, but I guess okay. I'm Chelsea now. Oh, well, I'm 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 uh, Man United. So so I, ah. I had to yeah. So you know, <laughs> we're doing a little bit little bit better this season. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's see if uh, let's see if Ineos uh, you know, come through the way they they seem to be coming through and can put a good uh, a good management there. We'll see. We'll see. It's always up and down, and that's that's the thing. You know, uh, the Premier League is just. Um, you know, it's funny you talk about the season tickets. It was yeah. so weird when I came out and when I had to actually figure out how to even get into the stadium. Um, I had well, I purchased a ticket from somebody and gave me their season pass. It was an actual card. That's the only way I got mm. into the stadium, which is so insane. Sure, sure, yeah. But um, I don't know if you guys yeah, have it, StubHub. It, with that process, we, we, we do, we do, we do have StubHub. Okay. But the problem okay. is the, the problem with the tickets is everyone's trying to um, they get trying to get away from ticket touts, right? Mm. And, right. And so they, they don't want people reselling the, the the everything anything above face value. They think it mm. kind of you know derives a value, and so that's why they do it. And I don't know if I have that issue because when I was in my early twenties, I built a pretty big network of, of ticket touts. One of my first entrepreneurial uh, ventures, oh. and, and so I think I think it's all about supply and demand. If someone wants to resell their ticket, uh, they should be able to do that. And but but mm -hmm. there are a lot of people trying to close that down. They do that through you know membership card systems, you know, and That's ID checks. Right. That's one of my first startups. Um, it was a startup called Revel. It was an event ticketing company. So mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with this space. That's that's where my journey started almost right. uh, 11 years ago now. So cool. Uh, awesome. Um, I think uh, as we kind of start to wrap up here, um, Martin, you know, really appreciate you coming on. Um, one last question for you. Um, what's your next big, big goal? Is it the autonomous uh, flight company that you have or what's kind of the next next thing for you i know you have a lot going on here what's kind of the main focus yeah so you know, right now you know, you know we're knee deep in an acquisition uh, so i need to get mm. get past that and okay. um i have a 10-year plan for autonomous flight so this and wow. um wow. parcel fly which is um you know i'm investing into the future in terms of uh, whether i'll be out there uh, licensing seats for delivering parcels by air or allowing the software to be controlled by someone like Amazon. We'll see. Uh, it's awesome. open. I do have a few great things that, that, that time may pass me by. And often, you know, you have great ideas and you want to act on them, but you can't do everything. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think there's a very, I think there's a very smart um, uh, um, network that, that's still not really there. Uh, that I think uh, Twitter um, uh, uh, hasn't, you know, hasn't solved, uh, even pre Elon Musk, it hasn't solved. And so my my interest, my future interests live, uh, they lie in, in trying to get to the truth of information, particularly in a world of um, popularism and, and mm -hmm. the, the easy reference that things don't appear the way they are or they're not real. I think there's a, a wonderful opportunity to authenticate truth using social networks. And I think there's still a lot of work to be done there. And if I get a chance, uh, I will put a lot of these ideas and, and, and you'll see a startup occur at some point. Okay. I love that. Uh, uh, well, next time you're in Long Island, maybe, and if we're filming or if we're around, hit us up. Maybe yeah, we can do this in person. You. I think oh, no. we'd love to pick your brain more for sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's sure. so many lessons to be learned here. And uh, I think we'll drop uh, the link to, to, to your Amazon link to the yeah, Startup to the Story book. book and, and I think, yeah, in the description of the episode and everything. In the description. Um, like that. Anything else that you would like to direct people to where they could follow you, at, I, I guess, and just in general? 
Yeah, so uh, on on Instagram, it's Martin Warner official. Um, the the book site, which has a lot of you know bio and everything and buying sites and stuff like that reviews, it's the Startup Story Book dot com. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I think if they want more information about me, uh, I think uh, one of the press sites like MartinWarner dot com, something like that. Okay, that has everything else. Awesome. Well, Martin, as Saz mentioned, appreciate you jumping on here. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day over there in the in the UK. And uh, for our you viewers, too. yeah, it's yeah, we have a. Place. It's pretty nice out today. Although it's getting cold over here in uh, in Long Island, as I'm sure during this yeah. year, yeah. as you know, it does. So yeah. we're bundled up. But um, you know, for our viewers, hope you enjoy this episode here with uh, with Martin. Super insightful. I know on Saj and I side. And uh, as always, hit the like, comment, subscribe button, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, yeah. Venture hustles, life is really what you make it. Building up your brand is whatever you created. Uh, really ain't no limit. Uh, you just gotta love it. Uh, working day and night, it's all about the venture hustle. Hey, venture hustles. Time to take it to the next level. Let's go.